This is a podcast for Kel. After Kel died, despite not having been in touch with her for five and a half years, her mother came back on the scene, demanding to take control of Kel's body and possessions. If you've listened this far, you'll have heard for yourself about the huge impact that Kelly claimed her mother's behaviour had had on her. For all of us who knew what Kel had been through, we couldn't allow it. The claim was grotesque. It very quickly became clear that this was something that would be going to court. What none of us could have anticipated was the mother's campaign of monstrous allegations aimed at the people who tried to actively be there for Kel, in part to help her deal with the damage that had been caused by her mother. But the mother's cause got traction and she raised thousands of pounds for her legal funds while publicly hounding the police to bring criminal charges against me. And she brought journalists along to our preliminary hearings trying to drum up interest in her case. Among many pre-trial motions, the court made an order protecting mine and Della's anonymity in any reporting of the case. This was because of the online abuse that was coming from lots of sources. If the mother named me or Della in connection with her allegations in open court, the press could report on it, leading to the distinct possibility that Della and I might have our faces splashed across the press as, respectively, human trafficker and paedophile. The basic outcome of all of that was that, in reports of the case, Della and I are referred to in the articles only as friends of Kells, we're not named. I must say, I personally felt uncomfortable with that. I'm very proud to associate my name with Kelly's, and the fact that she chose to take it as her own is one of the great honours of my life. One of my personal motivations in doing this is to now and forever to say that Kelly Gordillo was my daughter and I was her dad, even though we found it in a very strange way. And it was not a conventional father-daughter relationship, but that's what we were. The legal proceedings lasted for six months and there were delays and adjournments for one reason or another. But the final hearing took place over four days in October 2018. In her crowdfunding for legal fees, the mother had promised a landmark case where these issues of child trafficking, grooming, child exploitation and coercive control would all be exposed. But in fact, at the trial, none of those questions were raised with me or any of the other claimants during our cross-examinations. And that is because those allegations weren't backed up by any evidence. They just existed on the mother's say-so. What was difficult to deny, though, were the thousand pages of statements and exhibits that our side submitted to the trial. The point of it, simply to show, based on all the recorded evidence, who Kel would have wanted taking care of her affairs after she died. Over 30 people submitted statements and letters for our side. The case was overwhelming. The mother's defence and counterclaim had run to 124 pages, but it contained many more crazy allegations and gross distortions of circumstantial facts. But there was one allegation in the mother's trial bundle that disturbed me more than any other, and it didn't come from the mother. It came from her elder sister, Kelly's aunt from New Zealand. Kelly's mother and her older sister had been estranged for 16 years, but in the wake of Kelly's death, they reunited. What was so weird about that to everyone was that the aunt in New Zealand had been powerfully against the reappearance of Kelly's mother, wishing her all kinds of ill. She blamed her for Kelly's death. But somehow she then seemed to make up with her sister. Goodness knows what Kelly's mother said to her. But anyway, now we came to this trial. The mother had got her elder sister, the aunt in New Zealand, to write a statement for her side, explaining why Kelly's mother should ultimately have the right to decide what happened to Kel's affairs. I just want to be clear that that wasn't the part that disturbed me. I don't agree with it, but I do understand the New Zealand aunt's need to go back to the certainty of blood is blood and that a mother should be respected and that those things are just inviolable truths. I think a factor that would certainly have swayed the aunt was that at that time, 
and this is now, I guess, in the first month, six weeks after Kelly's death, we became aware that um, Kelly's mother had been approaching distant cousins, distant family members, and spreading the idea that back in 2009, she had walked in on me and Kel in bed together. And this definitely was believed for a while by some of Kelly's cousins. And I dare say it's, you know, that kind of thing that would have made the aunt feel extremely suspicious of me because the mother can be very persuasive. Auntie New Zealand made critical statements of me based on some phone conversations that we'd had the weekend of Kelly's death. And even there, I can understand why she might have felt some of those things. We were both very emotional on those calls. We were right in the middle of dealing with Kelly's passing. What I was shocked by was the fact that a blatant lie had been inserted in the aunt's statement. Kelly's mother had strenuously gone around denying that she'd ever been physically abusive to Kel. And having read our statements, she'd focused in on the allegation that she'd broken Kel's foot, saying that this was all part of our conspiracy to paint her as an abusive mother in order to cover up our own criminal roles in Kel's death. But Kelly's aunt in New Zealand now wrote in her statement that during hers and my phone conversation, the weekend that Kelly died, that I'd confessed to her that I had in fact made up the story that Kel's mother had broken her foot in a rage back on the 29th of April, 2009. Although, as you can see in the statement, the aunt misremembers that as a broken leg. But nevertheless, she said that I confessed to her that I'd made up that lie along with Des, that we'd agreed to concoct that. Never mind that Kel had told Uncle Des and me about the broken foot and then begged us not to report it to social services, which happened either on the 30th of April or the 2nd of June 2009. Never mind, as the witness statements showed, that Kel opened up about this incident to four friends on a camping trip in April 2016. Never mind that she separately told Grandma Della about it when she was in Barbados at age 15, and also back in London had told her friend Romina. I had to drag it out of her. What the fuck happened to your foot? No, Cal, you didn't walk into the fucking furniture. I'd drag it out of her. She didn't want to tell me. She wouldn't tell me. Her mum pushed her down the stairs. Never mind that Kel then wrote to her mother in 2012, saying, don't you think I remember you breaking my foot? And never mind that you heard Kel bring it up herself around the dinner table with me and my dad on January the 3rd, 2018. Because I remember horrible things like grandma, but not. Sure, so not like, that. Hitting yeah. with a slipper when I didn't do my timetables right. Like, I remember those things, but it's not like... Yeah, it was not what... I broke my foot. Yeah, right. Or, like, you know what I mean? I clearly did not tell Auntie New Zealand that I had made the story up about the mother breaking Kel's foot. It shocked me more than anything else that the auntie, who I, you know, always thought was a good person, would allow such a thing to be so flagrantly inserted into her statement. And not just because, up until Kelly's death, she had called me brother, but because the New Zealand aunt knew that she was lying when she wrote this. It was written to back up the mother's statement. The aunt in New Zealand convinced herself that it was worth telling this lie to serve a greater good, a mother's right. I understand some triggered social justice warrior jumping to the mother's defence more than I understand the aunt here. Because the aunt knew the truth of what had happened to Kel. And somehow she let herself be swayed and manipulated by her charismatic sister. In fact, Auntie New Zealand, who had not seen Kel since Kel had been seven, now turned away from Della, her mother, for siding with me, an interloper. She said that at times like this, it was blood that counted and it was blood that should stand together. Kel's mother herself had been estranged from almost her entire family, certainly her close family, for nearly two decades. The stories about her were legendary. But within a month of Kelly's death, her mother successfully reconnected and, for want of a better word, turned two of Della's four children against her. As a result, three of Della's children no longer speak to her. It cannot be said often enough that the people who don't speak to Della are the people who never saw or had any active relationship with Kel herself. The only child of hers that Della now has any relationship with, and luckily they're close, is her youngest daughter, Rachel. And me. I call Della mum too. Both in tribute to Kel, but just as much in tribute to Della. One of the many demonstrable facts in this case is that during one of the several 
and serious physical attacks that Kel was subjected to at the hands of her mother growing up. Kel's mother broke Kel's foot. This required Kel to be admitted to hospital on the 30th of April 2009. We have the hospital records of the admission. We have direct testimony from six people at different times in Kel's life, all of whom say she told us it had happened, with evidence to suggest that she said it in front of at least three other people that we know about. We have Kel's reference to it in the divorce mails, and we have the recorded words of Kel herself. It is a fact that this happened. Another fact is that nine years later, Kel's abuser got Auntie New Zealand to lie to the court about it. What the auntie doesn't understand is that in supporting the mother's lie, she is in fact continuing the abuse of Kel. To make the mother's story fly, you have to deny Kel. The support of the people who back the mother's campaign depends on the suppression of facts like that. It depends on the suppression of Kel's truth. It depends on the suppression of the truth. There are many important reasons to make this podcast. But perhaps the biggest among them is that Kel be believed. Since the release of some of these episodes of the podcast, Kelly's mother has tried to say that the voice you hear on these recordings, who's Kel, is in fact a, an actor that I've hired after Kel's death. That all of these other people that you're hearing are paid stooges. Or... The idea of all of that is to try and suggest that all of this is here to corroborate me which is the ultimate act of gaslighting and re-abuse because everything that you hear in these podcasts is intended to corroborate Kel. We back her. If she hadn't said this to us over the years, we wouldn't be saying it now. So when you go to court, there's the claim that you make, then there's the counterclaim that the defence makes against you, and then the claimant's put forward the third set of documents, which is called the response to the counterclaim. Ours was 600 pages long, and it was full of documentation. Six more people came on the record, and some upgraded their statements. However, the release into the trial of the social service records, which the mother had fought long and hard to keep out, made it impossible for the mother to continue saying that suspicion of me was the reason that social services had been involved with our family back in 2008 and 2009. One thing was what the mother said on Twitter, another was what we were asked about in court. Instead of being cross-examined about child grooming or coercing Kelly into a life of prostitution, I was asked about the fact that I had sometimes known that Kel had done MDMA and had not discouraged her from doing it, which is true, I said that in my statement. Would this not make some people think twice about appointing me as Kel's executor? I defended why, but later in his judgment, the judge ruled that I had been irresponsible in so allowing, and effectively this became the grounds from which I was disqualified. However, that was the extent of the grilling I got. Nor when Grandma Della had been put on the stand had she been asked about child trafficking or supposedly selling her daughter or gifts that I had allegedly bought her to buy her off. We were available to be asked questions about anything we had written and to be able to catch us out on this tissue of lies that we'd fabricated surely, surely would disqualify us from being responsible executors of Kel's estate. But we weren't asked about any of it. In fact, in their submissions, the defence stayed completely silent on the subject of grooming or coercive control or any of the lurid allegations that the mother was making online. They didn't even call Kelly's friends who had written powerful statements and adduced damning WhatsApp and text correspondence that Kel had written. The defence accepted this evidence and allowed it to go to the judge uncontested. The mother currently claims that all of that evidence was written by me and the words of Kel that we exhibited to the trial, and which actually came from many different people, that none of those are hers, that's me, I've hijacked her social media accounts and taken over her identity. But this wasn't the position of a defence in court, who'd had most of those exhibits for months and had plenty of time to question their provenance or call Kel's friends to the stand to quiz them. The defence accepted that all of the friends' accounts of Kel's wishes, and therefore Kel's words in the correspondence, were real. I was extremely anxious the night before the verdict. I would imagine everyone is. It's out of your hands and has the judge understood the essence of the case? Kelly's aunt Rachel, who I've come to call my sister, was over that night. All my pacing up and down worried her. 
I was here the day before the verdict was read and he, like, he, like John was saying, he was getting anxious and stuff like that. And I just, to be honest, I was shell shocked before any, before the actual final hearing because I'm watching my brother be like, not him. Like he's such, so calm usually and things and seeing him like that, so I was just kind of like, yeah, I feel, I feel your pain, bro. Like I really do feel your pain, but I'm just kind of like, my, my philosophy has been from the beginning of this, hope for the best, but prepare for the worst. Yeah. Like that has literally been my mantra for the whole of this. And I'm just kind of like, I'm, I mean, there have been days where I've just been like, I'm surprised they've even, like they're even giving her a platform to even speak in mm. a legal arena about, about her child that she did not want, that she had no caring about whatsoever. The fact that all the letters and statements from Kel's friends, along with the correspondence from Kel about her mother, the fact that all of that had been passed into the record without objection, that surely meant we had the case won. The defence had admitted our most important evidence. But I was worried about the implications. For the judge to find for us would be setting a precedent. Could a mother's right be denied? At the end, the specific issues separating each of us in court were quite narrow. The mother wanted a cremation for only blood family to attend and she wanted to keep the ashes. We objected to this, saying everything should include the non-blood family, i.e. me, Uncle Des, the friends. The mother also wanted to pay for the funeral, claiming on the stand that it was one last thing I can do for her, saying that anything from her daughter's bank account should not fund the funeral because that was money that had been immorally gained from prostitution. The real dividing issue was who would be the executor of the estate, and could we stop Kel's possessions falling into the hands of the mother? We'd seen how she'd distorted the little information she had to her followers on Twitter, and how carefully she excluded evidence that didn't fit her case, and exaggerated other elements that might. God knows what she would do in possession of Kel's laptop and phone. I also felt that our barrister, who'd otherwise done a great job for us and was passionate about the case, had made a tactical error during the trial that had hurt us. She'd call the mother to the stand, and challenged her on her abusive statements about us, as well as the inaccurate account of Cal's life that she'd been making publicly. But drawing the court's attention to the abuse that the claimants had been subjected to was a mistake, because none of those allegations had been put to any of us on cross-examination. The defence hadn't relied on those to make its case. By drawing the court's attention to the online abuse now, all we did was give the mother a chance to double down, and for the first time, make her allegations in open court. These were repeated and reported in the national press the next day, that Kel had been led astray by bad influences who could not be named and drawn into prostitution and drug abuse. Our barrister also took the mother to various points in the evidence where Kel had expressed her views about the abuse the mother inflicted on her. According to the mother, her relationship with Kel had been good and quite normal. It was only when Kel had come to live with me at age 18 and cut off contact with her mother that Kel's mental state had gone downhill. She said that she had not held Kel captive in her friend's flat in Ealing in 2009. She was forced to admit that there had been a police protection order made against her in June 2009, but she distorted the reason why it was given, minimising the threat that all of the agencies involved in that moment believed she posed to her daughter. She then repeated the demonstrable lie that social services viewed me as a predator. When she was led to Kel's so-called divorce mails to her mother, where Kel had put to her, don't you think I remember you breaking my foot? The mother now said that this allegation had not been in Kel's original mail to her in 2012, and that the correspondence had been manipulated by our side after the fact. She also said that Kel had very clearly written the email under my influence. I had not sat in a room with the mother and listened to her speak about anything for nine years. I found myself imagining what I would think if I didn't know anything about the case, and I inevitably, I suppose, found her compelling. She was the best person on the stand of all of us who testified, although Grandma Della's unflappable solidity ran her a close second. As I listened to my ex-girlfriend, I became aware, not for the first time, of my own ability to get caught up in what she said. There's no doubt that whenever she speaks, even on Twitter, she makes a case that sounds like it has to be answered. But then you remember the amount of physical evidence she has to suppress to get this story to fly. Of course she has to say it's fabricated and manipulated. What other defence can you make? 
but then finally you remember what this is. This is an abuser covering their tracks, leveraging the easy assumption that we all know men are scum who do dark sexual things over the counterintuitive truth, which was the mother's peculiar and complex abuse, the regime of gaslighting, physical violence and psychological control that she imposed on all around her, despite apparently being vulnerable herself. What makes no sense is why she'd put herself in this position, why come forward after Kel's death and make these mad allegations in public when the evidence against you is brutal. I've never seen anything like it. None of us have. The audacity of it is what gives it the credibility. If I hadn't known anything about the case, I'd think she sounded credible. Why would anyone get so worked up about this if it didn't at least have some truth to it? It's the question that everybody who knows the truth asks and nobody who knows the truth can answer. With stories, you will tell the lie at a certain point because you're angry or upset and later on, you regret it. For your ex, she never did. She just continued to enforce it, enforce it, enforce it, enforce it. And it, she'll take that stuff to her grave. I thought at some point along the time, during the case or after the case, something would happen, something would click in her brain. Those moments of sanity would come along at some point with your ex. I don't believe that's ever going to be the case. I don't believe there's going to be a moment. And that's why I believe her mental illness is really quite severe. I don't know, I guess in that sense that almost ties back to us shouting and screaming the best part of a decade ago when we're like thinking our mother's fucking insane. Like, I think she is. Like, there has to be something wrong with you on a fucking like biological, like a mental level within the chemicals in your brain to want to do that to someone. Like, it's fucked. It's very fucked. I feel like she almost just wants to try and make it about herself and um, just getting like media attention from it. Her mum doesn't know how to apologise at this point. You know, I'm Armenian and my mum goes on and on about the genocide and how Turks won't admit to it. And I'm like, mum, if they turn around and admit to it at this point, yeah, it's going to be really fucking awkward. <laughs> right. They ain't just going to turn around and give you your fucking mountain back, all right, and right. say, oh, we've just been bullshitting for how long? All right, you can't. That's like, at some point, you have to carry on the old act. Do you know what I mean? And I believe that's where her mum's at. She mm. has to keep up the public facade. She has mm. to be this person that she's created for herself. I yeah? think she has to actually believe what she's saying. I don't actually think it's it's possible mm. for you to tell those kind of just outrageous lies. And not just once, but continue to tell them again and again and well, again. You, it's like she has to believe it herself. Well, not only that, but the thing is, the more you tell something, the more it becomes believe believable, it. isn't yeah. it? So she has to keep repeating it to herself yeah. to know that to, to make it true, to make it sound believable. From meeting her other siblings and knowing her mother and knowing her daughter, <coughs> right. impossible to think that it's because of the environment that she was raised in. It has to be something that's in that's genetic, doesn't it? We're talking about this in terms of mental health and we're mm. talking about how Kel struggled with her mental health. But it's also quite hard to speak about Kel's mental health struggle without speaking about the mother's. The two are so intrinsically linked, whether mm. it's like, whether you think about it from a biological point of view, whether you think about it from like a nature nurture point of view, they're so intrinsically linked. Yes, she's done some awful, awful things and she is like, a, she is probably is an actual psychopath, but it's quite hard to not feel a little bit of compassion. And Katie's shaking her head. No, I think that we shouldn't make the mistake of trying to think of the mother as a person. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm not even joking. Mm. Like, I think that she might be a psychopath, meaning that she has a more animalistic brain than like a normal person does. And is, thinks more like a predator. Probably from what I've seen of her, from what Kelly told me, from everything, all of this, I feel that she, she, she sees human beings in terms of prey mm. and she, she's good at picking on something that she can see as a vulnerability or a way to ingratiate herself. Mm. And then she just goes for that and people are stupid enough to believe it. So I think there's an extent to which talking about what's going on in her head is pointless. You know, just throwing around terms and like even, yes. and even if This is somebody... also something that happened to Kel as well where because doctors were throwing around terms saying you have this, you have that. And but, I don't think that's But in the anyone. absence no, of knowing, true. and all we can go upon is behavior. Mm. And this is someone who, regardless of what's driving her, is a highly competent person in the world, is quite able to bring people over to her cause and to convince people of things mm. that are not true. 
Well, yes, but and I get that. You deny that you received the correspondence when you've made a reply. Oh, it's ridiculous! And she replied to it, and then Kelly forwarded the, 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 that correspondence straight to you and straight to me. So, the, you know, now she sits on a witness stand trying to pretend that she didn't write it or she didn't know. Well, we know she's a liar. There's absolutely, absolutely. no question about that. I think we've all seen her lying. I mean, anyone who was in any of those days where she was speaking in court saw her lie. And in that first trial, the judge called her out and was Absolutely. like, well, you just lied about this. He but she's a good one because she told a bold-faced lie on the stand uh, in relation to her contact with Kale after 2012. And the judge believed her. In the judgment, <laughs> the judge said it had the ring of truth about it. It's a sign of how well the mother presented on the stand that a key piece of evidence, which was a complete fabrication, was believed by the judge. On the stand, the mother had claimed that Kelly had been trying to get in touch with her whilst she, Kelly, had been away for a break that she'd taken in the summer of 2016 with her younger brother. And the judge, while acknowledging this hadn't appeared anywhere in her evidence before, felt that it had the ring of truth to it. Online, in fact, in her Twitter and her fundraising campaigns, the mother had been much bolder about that, saying not only that Kelly had been trying to reach out to her in her final years, but that Kelly had been seeking rescue from the regime of isolation and forced prostitution that the mother claimed Kelly had been forced to live under since coming to live with me. But there's quite a lot of evidence to refute this. In addition to the anecdotal comments that friends like Romina claim Kelly made to them while she was alive, that she would never seek a relationship with her mother. There are also references to this in the written evidence. In her letter, Kelly's friend from Sixth Form College, Hafsa, described a lunch meeting between Kel, Hafsa, and their friends, Paige and Aquash, where Kelly said she wouldn't have any wish to contact her mother in the future. There was also the Facebook correspondence that Kelly had had with James I while she'd been staying at the Nightingale, where she quite clearly says that she'll never contact her mother again. There's another piece of evidence, and it's in the conversation that Kelly had with me and my dad on January the 3rd, 2018. On the recording, my dad, Alberto, asked Kelly about her relationship with her younger brother. As Kel alluded to in episode seven, Kel saw her younger brother, who'd actually been brought up by his father after the courts awarded him custody, as the golden child of the family, and she felt she was treated as the scapegoat. I can confirm some of that because Kelly's younger brother used to come and stay with us when Kelly and her mum were living with me. And this would have been, he would have been between about the ages of seven and nine. And Kel's mother would be affectionate with her son and praise him in ways that I didn't see her be with Kel. And over time, that was another reason that my heart had gone out to Kelly because I couldn't see what she'd done to deserve being shunned like that. Yeah, I mean, he wants to come visit me at work, but I don't see him that often because he's... How you get down with him? What? I take him on holiday, um, this summer, this summer before. We don't really get along. I don't know how I feel about that. I don't really think about it that much. It makes me feel bad because I feel like I should be there. For him? Why do you feel he should be there for him? This is my brother and I do love him and also... I feel like he should have somebody, another person, I know he has his dad, but he has his like, cousins and his aunts and stuff, but another person who understands a bit more. Who knows, who witnessed it. Who's consistently there. Yes. But, yes. in some ways I don't feel like able to deal with it. Sure. And it makes me feel bad because I should sure. be maybe a bit stronger, but I don't really know what to say. Yeah, what can you do? I mean, you, you, you. I don't know, yeah. Like, I just want to disengage from, from her. From her? Yeah, I feel like it's almost from that situation. I don't want to think about it. I don't want to think about her. To be honest, most of the time it's not like an actively not thinking about your mother. I just sure. forget and like, sure. I have enough to deal with in my sort of daily life. It's not like I struggle and it's not think about her, but when I'm when I was with him and more there, it felt like it was. It felt like it was. Like present or her spectre was present. So there was a connection, like her sister's concerned, like there's too much of a... a... connection between you and her as a result of seeing him, is that what you mean? Yeah, like right. you know, I wanted like more degrees of separation from that. It felt really strange, I don't know why. And it put me in a weird mood for a couple of weeks afterwards.
It's absolutely impossible to think from that that Kelly was trying to reach out to have even minimal contact with her mother in her last years. People hear the mother speak and they instinctively believe her, or they want to. But the price of believing the mother is that you disbelieve her victim. Another fabrication of the mother's case, which was clearly dispelled by the trial, was the idea that Kelly had been isolated from friends and family or proper means of support. But in reality, this was a projection imposed by the abusive mother who, in fact, in life, had consistently sought to isolate Kel from people who loved her. But separately, this idea of Kel being isolated upon her return to London in 2012 made absolutely no sense when you looked at the sheer numbers of people who wanted to write statements for her for her trial and who came to the court day in, day out, so they could stand by their friend. This is James I. I thought it was a really weird element to think that Kel had no friends at all, which is a strange claim. Right. That's a very strong claim. That's probably the strongest claim I'd isolated all of it. her, but, she'd, but then she had all of these people who were willing to speak for exactly. her. Exactly. So who are all these people that right. speak? Because if they're saying this is someone that's completely isolated and it's to blame on one individual, it doesn't explain all the friends and all the friends being on one side. The biggest claim is to say that Kel had no friends that were real friends and knew her because, as we've said, this is someone that was incredibly open, formed connections with people so easily. And obviously there's these incredibly strong bonds made, so we've seen that and people have come forward. So it's yeah, strange to say that Coward and her friends. There was something about her that truly touched all sorts of people and the loyalty and the kind of quality of people that she seems to have attracted. You know, all of these people who really want to speak for her and stand by her even now. They're all reflections of what she gave us. Mm. That's what we are. We really are. Yes. We won the case. Going in, the three of us, the claimants, had all agreed that if we won the case, we would back whoever was appointed executor. And so we were delighted when the judge appointed Grandma Della to that role. It was ordered that the funeral should be an inclusive affair with everyone attending, just as we'd asked. It was also ordered that Kel's ashes should be scattered to the wind in the Garden of Remembrance at the crematorium but it was ordered that the cost of the funeral be split between the claimants and the mother 50-50. In practice, it ended up being the claimants who shouldered the cost. The mother did not and still hasn't paid her half, despite saying in court that it was one last thing she could do for her daughter. There were so many friends and family in court that day, we all wept as we poured over the judgment. Even our lawyers shed a tear. They'd become so involved in Kel's story. It, it, you kind of forget, you just forget, it's easy to forget that she's not here. Mm. I think that's the thing, is that is when the judge was reading it out, and then I just was like, oh, I feel such relief, and then I was like, why? Yeah. Because, mm. and I remember you saying before, being like, guys, you know what, no matter what happens, nothing's going to bring her back. Mm. Mm. So I think it's, I don't know, it's easy to forget that. We could spend hours talking about all of the crazy ins and outs of that case. But the details aren't as important as the fact that it happened at all. The very fact of it was a manifestation of the thing that Kelly had been up against. And on her behalf, we fought. And on her behalf, we won.
it was just drawn out so long. Like I feel like maybe normally a funeral would be much, much faster and there'll be a lot more raw grief on the table. Mm. But I think we'd all been grieving so much and the grief, it's almost like what had happened had taken the grief and amplified it. So it's just so fucked. I guess it just doesn't, it's still, I thought that it would sink in, but this, like, I just, I didn't think that, I, it still didn't sink in at all. I didn't think that she was like, I kept looking at the coffin and being like, it's too small, <laughs> she's too tall to have fit in there. Oh. It just didn't, I don't know, it didn't seem to sink in. It was astonishing that Kel's mother didn't come after all the fuss she'd made, but it was also entirely predictable. I guess deprived of an audience that would have approved of her antics. It was just another, albeit final, sign of her neglect. We weren't sure during the main funeral service if she was going to pop up, but once it became clear that she wasn't going to show, there was a palpable sense of relief. And when we all went off to the crematorium, that part of the service was actually very personal and very touching. People spoke freely. But I found like the actual funeral service quite, it was quite hard to connect with because I just felt like what everybody was thinking was like, is she going to turn up? And here we are where we've made all these concessions. So there was just that elephant in the room. Like every time the door opened, everybody's head turned to me. It was getting comical. Like it actually was getting funny. Um, I found the cremation was actually quite, like it was a lot more moving. And I think, you know, with people being, being, being given the chance to speak was a lot, was very oh. nice. And oh. then Sam, like meeting people who I like knew, like so many people who I like recognized or names that I knew, oh. but who I'd never met before. And I, I thought exactly the same thing as you. I thought, why did we not all know each other before? And, you know, how could that have made everything different? And I've been thinking a lot about that this week. I was like, you know, what if I just, what if I talked to you one time and was like, oh, I saw Kel and this happened or, and you would go, oh, well, you know, I noticed that this happened and then we could both be like, well, actually, maybe that means that we need to do something about it. Exactly. But as an, when you're an adult and you, especially when you live in London and you move out of home and everything is kind of different, you live your own life. So you yeah. don't. You know, you have people in your life who are connected, but I think Kel had people from all over. Mm -hmm. And in, that's amazing. But I think that that is also the reason that while everybody kind of knew she was struggling, nobody realized the level it was on because we weren't talking to each other Absolutely. enough about it. Absolutely. Which is, you know, such a shame. A tragedy. With the trial and the funeral out of the way, next on the horizon would be Kelly's inquest. Finally, we'd be able to ask the questions that we should have asked months ago. What exactly had happened in that hospital? What had the staff seen? Had Kelly meant to do it? Would her laptop and phone tell us more about her state of mind and help us understand why Kelly had died? And what of the hospital itself? How had this been allowed to happen? An internal investigation into Kelly's death conducted by the hospital would reveal significant problems with their procedures, along with a care decision made by Kelly's consultant, which broke a core hospital rule and which in practice allowed Kelly to take her life without fear of being discovered. This is a podcast for Kel. <laughs>